Okay, so today we are going to talk about design guidelines and design patterns. So if you, if you remember, uh, we talk about um, theories, principles, and guidelines, and then we said at a certain point that, well, we cover theories, we cover principles, we also have seen heuristics as sort of principles, and then we always said, oh, there are these guidelines that are the low-level focus advice, that are very good in specific cases, that are very, very practical, operational, and we will see them later on. And today we are going to see these later on things that are guidelines. So guidelines are, I was saying, very specific, very practical, operational. That means they, they fit in specific context only, and not, uh, they are not, of course, generic as principle, heuristics, or even theories. Uh, so let's have a look at some guidelines for designing. Hmm? So guidelines is the how you implement principles in some specific context. Guidelines are shared languages to promote consistency, uh, within specific contexts, within specific platforms, uh, within specific technology. And so they help define how you implement things, how you realize, how you design things in a way that is more practical than principles and, of course, more practical than, uh, than theories. Uh, guidelines are often, not always, but often rule-based. So there is something that should apply work to, to the guideline to, to be. So if something is true, then you have to do this. Or to reach this goal, you have to do these things. Mm? So one example of guideline is um, the one that you met, for instance, in web application course. So a guideline for accessibility, I already made this example in the past, a guideline for accessibility is that every image has an alternate text associated to it. That is a, a, a rule. Every time you find an image, you should add an alt tag for that image, and that alt tag should have a meaningful text associated to it that is describing the image. So in this sense, it's a rule. Guidelines are often based on best practice, and encapsulate experience of designers, of experts, in a way, in that specific domain, and in some cases are defined as standards. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, so these are the good things about guidelines, they are sort of standards, they are based on best practice, and they're created by experts, and they are often rule-based, so you can easily apply them. You don't have to figure out if it is a consistency problem, like an heuristic, or it's more help and documentation, or it's more visibility of the system status, etc. But you have a rule. You have an image, you have to put alt text. You have a link, you have to put a title. It's simple rules to be applied. Some way, in some cases, also automatically applied. However, on the other side, in some cases, they are too specific and hard to apply in some situation. So the rule about web accessibility, every image should have an alt text, apply very, very well to web and images. But what if I am on mobile? Is the same rule applying in the same way? And what is the alt text of an image on a mobile? So that should be a different set of guidelines that may or may not apply and may or may not be identical as a rule to the web uh, guideline. And of course, it's difficult to develop a general purpose guidelines. That's why we have principles and heuristics that are a little bit higher because they are more general purpose. So let's have a look at some guidelines, just, just in the screen without going to much detail. So one guideline, we, one set of guidelines that we can, we can look at is on the web is the web style guide. The web style guide is uh, a book, but it's also a website that describe how you should style things on the web. Again, specific domain, specific context, the web, web application, website, and a very specific angle on that, that is about styling. 
It's not about layout, it's not about anything, it's just about styling. So um, the, the books goes on on uh, like topography and these things, trying to give rules for people to apply so that their uh, web application, website are styled in the best ways possible. This is something I mentioned to you already, the web content accessibility guidelines, like the one about, about the text, we can open this. Um, these are standard, with, with W3C standard. And um, just to have a look at some of them, they are translated in multiple languages. Um, uh, let me find where they are. Well, there are also the version 3 now, but let's say the quick reference. So these are guidelines that are also called like guidelines. So for instance, guideline 1.1 say text alternative. Provide text alternative for any non-text content so that it can be changed into other forms people need, such as large print, braille, speech, symbol, or simpler language. And this guideline is specify is uh, a level of priority, a, a, triple, a double A, triple A, uh, and you have specific rules that guide you in applying that guideline, like using a ARIA label to provide labels for object, uh, using a text alternative on one item within a group of image that describe all the items in the group, using alt attribute on EMG elements, using the body of the object elements, etc. So this is very specific. And if you click on this, you also show, there is also an example showing you how to do things. And indeed, browsers have in the um, performance, etc., the possibility to perform checks on accessibility for instance, like this is Chrome based. And if you analyze, let's say the page, according to the accessibility, what the tool, the automatic tool is doing is actually checking the content web page according to that guidelines. Because since they are rule, it's easy to create a software that automatically checks if the rule is met or not. So in this case, of course, luckily, the, um, the web page for the uh, accessibility guideline is 100% accessible according to those same guidelines. So they did a good job. Um, and anyway, there are, even if there are rules, there are things that is not possible to check automatically and that is left to the person to check manually. Because there are rules, of course, it's easy to check them, but some of them needs a human intervention. For instance, uh, interactive control are keyword focusable. This is not something that can be easily done um, by an analyzer like this, but a person can easily uh, try it by selecting, putting the focus on the page and pressing tab. Pressing tab if elements that can be clickable are you can move around the page and click just without the mouse, just using the keyboard. And so if you want to visit a link, you press enter. So that are all elements are keyboard focusable and accessible. So this is something that you can write a script, a program to check it, but from the browser, it's easier to say, this is something you have to manually check. And so there are some, some things that needs manual checking, or the page has a logical order. The logical order of the content is not something that you can automatically check, but it's something that a person can say, okay, is, is logically ordered the content of this page or is not? Hmm? So rules, and given that there are rules, some of them can be automatically applied, others should be manually applied. Hmm? Uh, and, and this is an example, of course, this is about accessibility, and this is about the web. So these rules, as I said before, cannot be as easy applied to virtual reality or applied to other contexts, to speech. There will be another set of guidelines, maybe overlapping with that, 
with this, but not the same set, not the same set of rules, because of course it's a different technology, it's a different context, it's a different um, variety of, of, of needs. Um, so these are other kind of guidelines, still on the web. Uh, then there are like governments that provide guidelines for the uh, user experience of their own citizen. So in this case, these are the um, uh, US government mobile user experience guidelines. So again, a set of rules, a set of recommendations specific for mobile user interface, not for whatever mobile application, but for mobile application for United States government. So in theory, every mobile application created by or for the government of the United States should apply these guidelines. And these guidelines, so the United Kingdom government has a similar set of design system. In this case, a design system, so it can be used on multiple, um, on multiple technology, let's say mobile and web, and they also have patterns that we are going to see. So it's something more, a little bit more complex and richer than simple guidelines, but still is a set of recommendations, guidelines, rules, things you can use if you are creating something that is for the uh, United Kingdom government. And of course, it Italy also have the government guideline system for public administration website and application. Hmm? That's called, uh, that is this one. Uh, the website is in Italian, of course. Uh, well, there is also, I think, an English version somewhere. Um, but again, also this one provides guidelines, rules, etc., for creating a um, website, for instance, for every Italian government public administration, be there a municipality, be there a ministry, be there something else. And so every country, more or less, right now has some governmental guidelines to create applications, web application, mobile application, etc. And some of them, like Italy or like United States, also have this, this oh, sorry, like the United Kingdom, also have the design system. That is a set of guidelines, a set of patterns, a set of components, a set of stylistic rules that you can use and you should adopt in your uh, systems. So if you go in some website of municipalities, different municipalities in Italy, you should in theory, find them similarly. Hmm? So to ensure consistency across the various government-based websites. So the municipality of Turin should have, should be similar, the website should be similar to the municipality of Milan or Rome or Vercelli or whatever, hmm? because they should be following this same principle, the same guidelines and design system. Uh, then, of course, companies have their own guidelines. So Apple has the human interface guidelines for their own product, of course. So you are creating something for the Apple ecosystem. You have the guidelines that you have to follow and also patterns. And similarly, Microsoft has the Microsoft Fluent design system that includes guidelines for creating application in the Microsoft ecosystem. And as well, Google has material design system that includes guidelines and patterns and component for Google-based systems, especially Android, but that also others, hmm? Chromebook, etc. So, but again, while you can use material design for your own random website, application, etc., because it's a design system you can use, it was fought originally for their own system, for their own case study, and it covers well what they find important in their ecosystem and not necessarily what's important in another context. Mm? And some of these systems have a good take on, let's say, accessibility. So they automatically implement some of the accessibility guidelines, for instance, others instead say, well, accessibility guidelines are there. It's your duty to implement them. Mm? So these are, of course, is, is not possible to, again, to generalize. But every system, every technology, every angle has a different set of guidelines and some of them overlaps. And if you look at them, uh, some of them are, of course, related to the principal heuristics that we have seen, just more specific. And then there are guidelines for specific technology as well. So not just the web or the mobile or company, but for instance, Microsoft Research 
uh, created a, a series of guidelines for human-AI interaction. So when an uh, AI system is included within an uh, um, interactive system, what change? So Microsoft created a series of guidelines and a series of steps in the format of cards, like real cards, with examples hmm, in which there is the guidelines, the things like make clear how well the system can do what it do, and then example in practice how it is implemented. Hmm? So different from practices, that is just the principles that are more general, this is also have solutions attached, technical way to realize it in some way. Hmm? And, and on Monday you will do um, a full class about human AI interaction, so I'm not going too much in detail here. And just to make another example, on another totally different uh, technology, there are guidelines for augmented reality. Hmm? So something that, of course, apply to augmented reality, does not apply to AI, does not apply to real reality, and probably does not apply to virtual reality because this is a set of guidelines that are specific for that technology. Mm? And here, for instance, these are the Apple guidelines for augmented reality. Mm? One of the few, actually, guidelines on augmented reality specifically mm? that exist. Mm? And, and you see, everyone has a different format to report these guidelines. So this Apple is more long text to read, etc. The W3C accessibility guidelines are instead more a table with guidelines and then uh, sub-guidelines and then level of severity and then examples and then example of the examples, etc. So it's more depth. Mm -hmm. Because guidelines are really specific to uh, the organization and to the, um, to the technology that apply them. Okay, and this is about guidelines. So I, I cannot present you one guidelines that apply for everything because it depends on the technology of the context, etc. Um, so these are a few examples of good guidelines or well-known guidelines that you can also rely to, especially if you are doing something for the web in the future, the accessibility guidelines. Uh, please implement accessibility guidelines uh, because they exist forever and the web is still not accessible. So there is some, always someone that is excluded uh, in some way for accessing web applications. Uh, the other as well, if you create an Apple application for the ecosystem, you have guidelines for that. And if you create an Android system, you, you have guidelines for that, etc. Or if you need to, to create something for the public municipality of a city, then you have guidelines for that from the Italian government or any other government, uh, at least in Europe, um, you have that. So these are guidelines. And some guidelines, like the UK or the Italian government website, also talk about design systems that includes patterns. So the question is, what is a design pattern? And let me ask you this question. What is a design pattern to you? It's a series of components that you can use across? It's, it's, uh, you can reuse. Reuse. Across uh, different tasks that the user needs to do. On a specific platform, however, right? Because design patterns. So, yes, design patterns are, we are going to see them, but are slightly different from guidelines, um, but still are related to a specific, let's say, technology of set of devices, so that's why they are more specific than, let's say, principles, etc. So, design patterns, the definition could be, they are well-proven solutions that solve commonly recurring problems. So, the key point is, if there is not a commonly recurring problem, there is not a design pattern, probably, hmm? or a widely available design pattern. So they suggest a specific solution to a specific problem, and the solution has been tested by others, and the solution can be reused. Mm -hmm. So there should be a common, a common problem that this pattern, this series of components, or that this component 
allowed to solve. And this is something that is tested and it became a standard de facto in a way or became something that is uh, common for a specific platform. We, we talk about what is standard for a mobile phone or the web. This, what is standard is probably a pattern uh, and it's something that we reused. So it's proposed in a way that one developer, one designer can pick it and use in uh, their own system, application, whatever. Um, and, and, and they, bore, they were born uh, because designers, most of the time, try to tend to reinvent things. Um, so it's some way hard to know how things were done before and why things are done in a certain way and how to reuse that solutions. So design patterns are a collection of things um, that help to solve this reusability and um, knowledge sharing between platforms, design, not platforms, within applications, system and designers and, and designs. So, well, a brief uh, introduction. Design patterns actually start from architecture, not from computer science, of course. Um, and the idea is this. Each pattern is a problem that occurs over and over. So it's something that is popular. It's not something that happens once. Uh, and then describe the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. So in the original idea of, design pat of, of a pattern, uh, of a design pattern, you have something, well, of course, the same things that, you have, that I already told you. You have something that is a solution of a problem that is recurring. And it's, of course, something that you want to reuse. So it's not something that you create for once and then you forgot. But here, the other thing is that, uh, is this, this last part of the definition. You can use this solution a million times without ever doing it the same way twice. So there could be variability in, within a design, a specific design pattern. And what they meant, um, so, uh, what they meant with this sentence? So it means that they are not too general but not even too specific. So they are closer in a way to guidelines than to principle because they are specific, but they are not much specific like, again, the example, every image should have an alt text. It's something a little bit more generic and it's something that helps to solve the same problem multiple times, again, reused. Uh, they are, as I said here, a shared language. So, what we called, in a way, the standards of a platform in previous lecture and exercises. Something that is a reference point, something that you know that you have to do it this way because that is so common, so standard, that became a pattern. Hmm? And they typically have a name that is specific and they are explained, even if they are created by experts, they are explain, explainable in a way that also non-experts can understand what it is. Uh, and they, in a way, we are still talking about architectural things, so the built environment, are, according to the, the author, a literary form. A literary form is an agreement between a writer and a reader, between two people, hmm, that has op opposite and different goals and scope. Hmm. So a literary form is, for instance, the fact that in writing, we always start a letter with dear someone and we close with best regard in a formal letter uh, or something like that. Hmm? Or also in an email. Hmm? When you don't know someone, you can start dear name, best regard, all the best, kind regards. So these are standard format. These are sort of patterns in writing letters specifically. Hmm? Um, so they define certain things to be in a certain place at the beginning, at the end of the letter, for instance, with a certain meaning. So the best regards is a way to say goodbye in a kind and formal way. So it's put at the end, the place of an email or a letter, the thing, and assume a specific certain meaning. So similar to that, uh, 
these also apply to architectural things and uh, user interface design patterns. Um, so here there is an example of, again, an architectural design pattern. So just to see which are the key components of a design pattern. So the design pattern here is called, which is the name of this design pattern for architectural? Sitting wall. What is a sitting wall? What, what's the name is, is suggesting you? A wall you can sit on. So what means that this wall should be very, very high? Low. No, low, but not too low because otherwise you cannot sit comfortably. So which is a good high? Like a chair. Like a chair. Yeah, exactly. So from the name, you have already, this is the name. This is the name that it should be understandable by non-experts. We are not architects, but we can all understand what is a sitting wall. Maybe we don't know which is the problem that stems from the sitting wall, but, but still we can understand. So in this case, design patterns are typically a name, and this is common also for user interface patterns. They have a name, uh, they can have image, uh, for sure they have a context, hmm? something that um, describe in a way where we are talking about. We are talking about not of a, for instance, indoor environment. Most of the case you don't have wall, sitting wall indoor, but it's something that you can talk about outdoor, in a garden, hmm? something like that. And maybe you want to separate area, space. So this is the context in which you are. Then you have the problem statement. So why this, this pattern stem? So in this case, in many places, walls and fences between outdoor spaces are too high. Uh, but no boundary at all does injusti injustice to the subtlety of the division between spaces. So there is a problem. It, we are outside. There are walls, and maybe they are not so needed to separate space. And actually, we have another problem that is people want to sit down. Um, and so, how we can balance this? So we can balance it with example, with solution that is a sitting wall that is pattern. And in a pattern, you have examples of solutions. So a pattern doesn't describe how a sitting every sitting wall should be but describe which are the characteristics of a sitting wall. This is probably the characteristic we, we mentioned. Something high, more or less like a chair, and how wide? Could be three centimeter wide? No, it should be like three meters wide. Probably it's too much to be sitting. You can be more, uh, you can rest, you can sleep on it. Uh, so it should be something in the middle, like let's say like a chair, more or less. And so and these are examples of solutions uh, that the pattern, so actually here in this image, uh, say that the height is the set height, exactly the chair, and the top is wide. And in the text they say how many inches, because this is made um, in English with not the metric system. Uh, how many inches height and width minimum should be or ideally should be. But then doesn't describe for a designer, for an architecture designer or for an architect, how it should look. It should be which color, which style, which size, which form. These are all free for the um, architect to imagine and create or where is in the garden, where is outside if it's covered or not. This is not things that are related to the pattern. These are examples of way to implement the pattern. So in this way, the, the design patterns are not too specific, but not even too general. They cover a specific case that stem from a problem, in this case, in the uh, built env in the environment, outdoor environment, and provide examples of solution and provide guidance on how to create that and exemplify one simple, one specific way to do that. That is a wall that is sitting, for sitting, so it shouldn't be too high and should have enough wide to width to sit on it. So define an object but gives the architects, in this case, the flexibility to personalize, to decide how, when, how long should be uh, the color, the style of it. 
And so this is the same also for user interface patterns. Mm? And we are going to see some of them. Uh, and then a design pattern description has also, well, the solution statement. Um, there should be surround any natural door areas. So the sitting wall, surround any natural door area and make minor boundaries, sorry, you surround any natural outdoor areas and make minor boundaries between outdoor areas with low walls about 16 inches high and wide enough to sit on at least 11 inches wide. So that is the description, the solution, the description of the pattern. Something a wall that should be a wall that high and that width minimum. And then again, flexibility to, to do everything else, to be more specific into that, to insert that into a specific architectural context. Mm? Of course, if you are doing a sitting wall in like a modern garden, it will look like very, very different than a sitting wall in a 14th century garden. Still maybe a sitting wall, but the style will be dramatically different. Mm? And the design pattern also has a reference typically to other patterns similar or opposing to this just to create links between things and while this is created for architecture the same structure is still used today including user interface patterns there is a name that should be understandable for non-expert there is context there is a problem there are examples of solution there is the solution with this uh, sort of not too specific not too general uh, description and there are references to other patterns that are similar or opposing or still related to it. Uh, design patterns also in most cases solve a problem of conflicting forces. Mm? So let's say that we have these two conflicting forces. Again, let's think for still for a moment to the real world. Um, so let's imagine that we have this conflicting force we we are indoor um this is the context and one force say that people are naturally draw towards light and the other force say they want to sit hmm? so thinking of, of a room like this uh how can I, let's say, satisfy the first bullet point? People are naturally drawn towards light. If I want to see natural, to, uh, to receive a natural light, not artificial light, where it should go in a room? Close to the window. Okay. The second one, I want to sit. If I go to the window, can I sit close to the window? Very close to the window in this room? No, not, not so close to the window. You can close sit there. And also in probably your room, you have windows. Do you have a sitting point built in the room for sitting close to the window or to the door? Yes or no? Yes. Who have? What do you have? Uh, you put it or it was there? you decide to put but i'm sure you have seen the window seat well maybe not this one no but in some houses there are a bench close to the windows close to the window or inserted maybe it's just built in the environment it's not something you put in it's something that is there so the window seat is a pattern is a design pattern in architecture that if you want to satisfy these two forces, you can have a bench close to the window, and this is called the window seat. And again, the name is clearly explainable and understandable for everybody. It's a seat close to the window. It's a window seat. And this is balancing forces. There is a problem, not nowadays, but there, is a pr there was a problem. People want to stay close to the window, but they want to sit comfortably, maybe you read a book, etc and there is not typically a sitting point close to the window especially maybe in not so modern buildings and so there is a pattern in architecture that's called the window seat and in some houses 
have this window seat already built in the apartment, in the house, close to some windows to balance these forces. Hmm? So this is an example of a pattern again. And you see, this could be done this way, this could be not made of wood, but it could be made of mar another material and it could have cushions and could be this large and could be also uh, extend after the window or not. These are the specificality, the things that are specific that is left to the designer in this case to create and to decide. But the pattern is you should have something probably uh, large enough to sit down similarly to the sitting wall and close to the window and that is let's say related to the area in which you are sitting down so at least something like this hmm? so this is probably what the patterns say uh, something like this and then it's up to the designer to design something different to use choose material choose the form etc 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 same things apply, of course, to human computer interaction and to user interface. Um, so what's the difference? The difference is that, of course, architecture is about a built environment and human computer interaction is about the virtual environment that you are interacting with or you are in, in case of, let's say, virtual reality, for instance. And design patterns, uh, are again the things we would say that are standards for for interface so while it's true that each user interface is unique has its own set of goals it needs to implement its own set of tasks and solve a specific solution etc but we don't want um, to force people to learn new convention every new user interface so when you also created your paper prototype you adopted some patterns knowing or not because you are exposed to them and so you always have seen things done in that way and you did it in the same way for the good or not that's another story but these are the things that stem from design patterns. these are the components that stem from design patterns so design pattern serves to create consistency across applications across um, services across system within a domain and of course has the benefit to accelerate user understanding of an interface they don't have to learn how to use something a new interface because they can build on their own experience on other interfaces that use the same patterns mm -hmm. uh, this is again also able to satisfy heuristics like the one about consistency mm -hmm. It helped to satisfy a risking and principle about the visibility of the system, about help and documentation, because if they don't need to learn, if they don't need to understand, they don't need much documentation and help. It helps to satisfy one feature of usability, that is learnability and understandability of a, a software, of a system. Because if you can rely on patterns that are created by others, well known, and you can reuse it, then you are helping minimizing problems that can emerge in these areas. So there is a lot of design patterns and there is a website that um, I'm going to, to just show you briefly that well define what is that list many many design patterns mm. and for some of them you can probably read the name and understand what it is so what is the password strength meter yes the meter that shows the strength on the password the one that when you type a password it can either show you colors let's say your password is strong or weak or not or you could have actually a, a bar that is animated you can have circles you can have uh, lights you can have like traffic lights you can have different things to implement that so uh, that is or navigation tabs or notification or modal modals are a pattern someone when they invented modals and from that moment on it became uh, widely used and then was reused and re realized as a pattern or the accordion menu etc so here there are quite a lot let's open 
modal, let's say. So you see, modals design patterns. They have a title, modal. Uh, they have a problem summary. They have examples with images. They have example of usage. And then there are more examples, the solution, and discussion, rationale, and related patterns. So more examples. So here you see multiple examples on how to implement models. Now, model is something you probably have implemented multiple times. But here, there is a more, let's say, um, definition and curated set of examples. So there are more than 77 examples of models. So if you have no idea how to create a model, how to style a model, you have like almost 100 different style for models that give you what you can do with models. It's quite a lot of examples. And the same things for, for others. So let's say the um, password strength meter. Mm. Again, title, problem summary, example, when it's appropriate to use it, mm. the solution, and what means a strong password, mm. and guidelines on choosing password, and examples. In this case, there are only um, 10 examples on this, not 100, but still you have quite some examples to be, to be more specific on the application of the patterns. So this website is something you can keep a look at, uh, especially when you will move towards the medium and the high fidelity prototype and see if there is any patterns that can actually help you to um, solve or to implement in a more common, standard, and reusable way, your um, something, your application. So let's have a look at a few patterns that you you know. These four, five are all patterns, all design patterns that are used, and uh, let's say they are positive patterns uh, in a way. Well, except the last one. Um, so accordion menu. What is an accordion menu? The menu which opens when you click on something. When you click on what? The main button. <coughs> the arrow. The, the arrow, yes. Typically, yeah, there is an accordion menu, an arrow, it's a style detail, and it's open. Uh, when you use an accordion menu? So here is an example of an accordion menu where you open uh, my drive and you have subfolders and then you open one this folder and there is other folders and you go in to this. So why this is, let's say, a good place, a good things to use an accordion menu and not, for instance, not having just all the things there. Yes, accordion menus are mostly related to the quantity and type of information that you have or data that you have. So something that we don't really explore in your prototype, but it, let's say in a more realistic real world scenario you have. Uh, so here there is a sidebar that has one, two, three, four, five, six items already. And two of them are expandable hmm, as an accordion. And within that you can have in Google Drive, as many as you want, folders. So that could be a very, very long list. So of course, you need a way to define which is priority one, which is the high, the first level hierarchy that are my drive, computer, shared with me, recent, special, and trash bin, and which are the lesser important, yet, let, yet something that should be easily accessible if needed to an accordion menu. Hmm? Drop down menu. So hmm? Yes, yeah, so you have a button typically or something, you click on it and it opens a menu that has options. Hmm? Could it be used instead of the accordion menu in the previous? Example, if you want to redo the sidebar 
of Google Drive? Can we redo it keeping the same functionality with a drop down menu? Yes. Yes. And which is the problem? The problem. Drop down menus uh, have a waterfall nature, so you have a uh, actually horizontal screw to. The problem is about the space uh, and also the easiness to make errors in selecting more things because you select, let's say, folder one here and then it's open, and other things on the right, and then you select maybe another folder, it's open on the right, and then if you want to go back, or if you just move the mouse, it depends how it's implemented, you maybe can open another folder instead of the one that you, you so it's, it's more difficult and you cannot keep them open contemporary in the same moment where accordion could be implemented also in that way. So in the case of too many elements, it's in this case, accordion menu is preferable. And also here, uh, either you, let's say, implement the, the entire, let's say, panel, but if you want to implement each of these as an accordion menu, so computer and my drive as an accordion menu, so you will have two buttons, one close to another. So you move from a vertical to an horizontal menu entirely with this menu that's open on the bottom and then move on the right. And so it could be um, confusing after if, if you have too many elements. Hmm? So if you have a, not too many elements and few actions. So typically drop down menus are used to for actions. So see in this case, these are actions. Uh, new folder, upload a file, upload a folder, Google document, create a new document, create a new document from template, a few actions that are more frequent, let's say used. Um, well, cards is another example of them patterns. There are quite a lot of user interfaces that are cards right now to convey information in a colorful uh, way, key information, and then you can typically click on the card and something happens. Uh, breadcrumb uh, to identify in which, uh, in which part of the website, of the page, of the process you are in, and could be implemented in multiple ways, uh, but the key idea is always the same. And then there is the burger menu, that became again popular uh, a few um, years ago and became standard, became a pattern to show menus when the you originally when the user interface doesn't have much space available. So the menu does shouldn't be always present because it is occupy space uh, and remove space from the main content. Uh, but then nowadays became really also in a large screen, you can have an hamburger menu that just present the menu top front and hide the content behind. Mm? But that is still the pattern. There is a button that is made with three uh, horizontal lines that resemble an hamburger and, um, and click on it, it opens a menu. And this menu could be on a sidebar, could be in the center, could be on the top of everything like in this video. Mm? So these are patterns that we, we can like it or not, it can be used for the good or not, but these are patterns that are reusable components that solve a problem and have multiple implementation for that. Uh, other example, so in Android mobile application, we have a slightly different set of patterns. So there is like a toolbar hmm, uh, that is typically used for navigation and for multiple actions, and it has a specific high, cannot be smaller than the specific high. Uh, there is the up bar that is actually a speciality of a toolbar. Hmm? That is the top most thing in a mobile application. There are tabs. Tabs in Android are most of the time towards the top of the, um, of the application of the screen. They are almost never at the bottom of a screen. Mm? And they behave in a certain way and they typically are below the up bar on the toolbar. Mm? And then there is navigation drawer that is the hamburger menu essentially, but it's always open as a drawer from the left to the right, at least in Western uh, languages. It has option in it. Mm? And this is a pattern, well-known common pattern in Android mobile application. Mm? And then also scrolling and paging 
as a specific pattern in Android. So in Android, 99% scrolling is vertical and in some cases horizontal, but it's used in a rare way horizontally and when it's used it's typically to scroll between pages or between uh, chunk of content, not really for moving horizontally on the page. In some cases it is, but typically is not. So the pattern is if you have str scrolling, it's for scrolling vertically the content of the page and not horizontally the content of the page. So these are patterns. And of course, patterns can be used for, let's say, uh, the good uh, or not. Uh, and so there is a category of patterns that is called, well, originally it was called dark patterns. Uh, now they're called deceptive patterns, but it's the same thing. So a series of patterns that companies or developers or designers use to, in a way, trick, to deceive people in doing something that maybe they won't do uh, on their own. So this is still patterns. This still relate to the definition of patterns and I'm going to show you um, some of them quite briefly, just to give you an example uh, so that you can avoid using them uh, and you are able to recognize them if you are in the future need to like redesign a user interface or something like that. Um, so, well, the term dark patterns was coined in 2010 uh, by this person, Harry Brignall, that is a designer, a professional designer, so not an academic. Uh, and his idea was to include all those patterns. They are deliberately, not by chance, not as a consequence of unwanted option, but deliberately adopted to promote choices that are not in the user best interest, but are maybe in the company best interest. Um, so, why I told you that these are called nowadays deceptive, pattern, deceptive design or deceptive patterns, also by the same, um, uh, how it's called, Brignall, uh, because it's a terminology thing, so there are many organizations that are moving away from certain terms, like master-slave to parent-child, for instance, that are more positive and neutral, from blacklist to blocklist, to avoid the concept that when it's black is bad mm? so to avoid that also in terminology in wording so in case of dark pattern the association of dark with harm is problematic for black people because you reinforce a, a concept um, a misinterpretation of this verb and so it may reinforce uh, racism heuristic of viewing this um, people with darker skin as evil, as bad. Mm? Uh, and so there is this tendency to replace certain terminology with other that are more appropriate and more neutral and don't introduce biases. And so dark patterns um, are now called deceptive patterns or deceptive design for the same, um, for the same reason. Mm? So this is an illustration of some deceptive patterns uh, identified by Bergnull and he has a website and you can look at it and there is a collection of patterns, etc. Um, like disguise ads, so advertisements that are disguised as not advertisements so that you are more uh, prone to click on them so that you can get revenue for, for the company or um, I don't know, the Roach Motel that the start is easy for a website and then quitting is hard. So when you create a subscription to a service, maybe it's very, very easy to get a subscription, but if you want to leave that service, if you want to cancel the subscription, maybe you have to do three steps and then a phone call and then send an email and then wait 30 days, etc. Subscription immediately, unsubscribe, two months of work to do that. This is to discourage people to unsubscribe, actually. Mm? So to keep people in the system, in the service, to have people pay in advertisement or in money. Mm? And this is another dark pattern, a roach motel is called as kind of a dark pattern. Mm? And so, and there are others, again, there is this website, deceptive.design, that as a gallery of deceptive patterns in the same form 
of the design patterns we are seeing. So there is a name, there is a problem, there is a solution, there are examples, there is a context, etc. But in this case, they are used for, uh, let's say, negative purposes and not for um, positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. So they are specifically highlighted for that. Uh, and there is also actually, uh, if you're just for opening a parenthesis, there are also work in research about dark patterns. So here there are as examples dark patterns because in some cases they're used in um, an unwilling way and in others instead as the definition are used in a more conscious way to create harm in some level of um, uh, in some level. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, um, let's say, five categories, five main patterns, um, deceptive patterns. One is nudging, that is a redirection of expected functionality that persists behind one or more interaction. Uh, the other is abstraction. So each of these contain one more specific pattern. So the uh, Roach Motel is, for instance, an abstraction kind of pattern. Um, abstraction means making the process more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, sneaking is attempting to hide, disguise, or delay the information that is relevant and should be communicated easily. Uh, interface interference is the manipulation of user interface that privilege certain actions that are more convenient, more remunerative, etc., than others. And force action is requiring the user to perform a certain action to access or continue to access certain functionalities. So these are not something you will explore with need find, you will find with need finding, or you will find in creating a user application that is centered on the user but it's something you will adopt if you want to center the application on your company-wide need in also, in some cases, in a not totally transparent way. Uh, so for instance, nudging. If you have a mobile application and you have seen uh, a mobile phone and open a mobile application where you turn off or don't enable notifications, sometimes the application will say, Turn on notification. You're missing things because you don't have notification turned on. So this is an example of nudging. You are on an application. You want to do the task that the application allows you to do, and your main action is interrupted by a reminder that is nothing to do with your action. That is, please turn on notification. This has nothing to do with. Um, with your task, with the main goal of the application, etc. So this is nudging. Mm -hmm. um, and also you have no way to say, never see this message again. You have okay, that probably brings you to the settings, and you have not now, that dismiss temporarily the message. But you have no way to say, I don't want to see it, I want to keep it off. This is again in contrast with user control and flexibility as a heuristic. Uh, this, I think, is, uh, is uh, uh, for example, for iOS, it's maybe impossible because um, you can only ask one time for notifications. So when you when the user says no, you can never ask it again. Although if you try, if you go to it, block. Yes, nowadays, like on iOS, this is prevented by Apple, but this needs like someone like the, the controller of the operating system knowing that this is a problem and preventing it because otherwise people will do it. So it needs control, it needs to reduce control for the flexibility to the developer so that they cannot do these things. Oh, this is taken from actual paper from uh, 2018. So luckily after six years or maybe less is for iOS is fixed maybe not for other systems. Uh, obstruction, this is uh, an example from iOS, actually version six, so quite a lot of time ago, um, in which is obstruction. So if you want to disable uh, AD tracking, you actually to, to navigate quite a lot in the settings to find the option and disable it. Mm? So it's obstruction, it's not as easy as it should be. 
to access that functionality. Nowadays, it's actually very, very easy on iOS to uh, limit tracking, but back then it was not. Uh, sneaking. Hmm? Sneaking is, again, providing actions that is not related to the task uh, or the action related here to get an advantage. So in this case, this is uh, unsubscribe for a newsletter that if you don't pay attention, uh, this is selected and if you press save all changes, so you have been already unsubscribed from the newsletter, so your main action is done, but the page is made in a way that you are invited to press this button, save all changes, and so you, in doing that, agree to the privacy statement that, by the way, tell you that you can use, that this company can use all your personal information and share it with whatever countries they want forever. That is totally nothing to do with unsubscribing from a newsletter. Hmm? That is something totally different, and this is to get your data, essentially, yes. Yes, but GDP, well, yes. <laughs> GDPR is against these kind of things in Europe, and there are similar um, rules in other parts of the world, like in Japan, for instance, but this is not, uh, not worldwide. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in the US, you don't have something that prevents you to do this. And even if you are in Europe, uh, this shouldn't happen, but until someone notice or report it, it may happen. So this is sneaking. Uh, interface inf infer interference. So you uh, do check out and you hide a checkbox that is checked within the more info link. So you open them. If you open the more info link, you notice that they're asking you for other information and it's already enabled that function. So you are accepting something without knowing. Mm -hmm. Again, you are accepting uh, that you will receive emails from this company and all the related companies until you unsubscribe from the communication. But this is hide. This is hidden in the user interface. It's not visible. Mm -hmm. You have to expand more info. That is not normally something that you want to do in the process of buying things. Because, um, because, well, that could be also probably considered parts of sneaking uh, because you are hiding information for that part there. Um, but in this case, it's categorized under interface because interface interference say manipulation is interface that privilege certain action over others. So here there is, yes, there is hiding like sneaking, but there is also a certain action that is privileged or the privilege with respect to others. Uh, instead, in the sneaking example, there was not privilege, it was all, everything at the same level. So this is uh, why they classified in, the, uh, in this other level. And finally, forced action. Like if you have Windows, uh, you know that after a certain point, you can either update or update, or keep the computer on. You cannot shut down, you cannot restart the computer without updating. So this is done with some clear ideas in mind. It's not done for, for Microsoft to gain money or whatever, or information or steal something for you. It's actually done with a good purpose, that is, there is an update. Do the update because the system will be safer and more secure and with more functionality. So it's done with a good purpose. Uh, but is again limiting the control and the flexibility of the user. What if I don't want to wait one hour that the update is applied successfully? What if I just want to shut down the system and go away? 
instead of waiting half an hour for the update to install and then when they restart the computer waiting another 50 minutes because the, because the operating system will not start anyway what if, if i'm in a rush and it's not the good moment to do this operation here hmm? so on windows 10 this was uh, something that happens but also on windows 9 and previous generation of windows um, something that happened hmm? so the system decide when it's the right time to update and not you that is again you have also an heuristic that say that this is not not something good because it leaves removes control even if in this case is done for a good reason that is having your system more update more more secure etc 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 so this is force action you are forced to do something that you are not interested to and you have no option to that so this is less man less uh, deceptive than the others but still uh, a deceptive pattern and then I'm not going to into detail here I, was, I want to stop now uh, there is a specific category of deceptive pattern of damaging pattern this is called attention capture uh, damaging pattern uh, you can have a look if you want let me just uh, show you one example so infinite scrolling is an attention capture um, deceptive patterns because you don't have a clear sense of when the content stop you can spend hours let me change the verb you spend hours and hours on social media and this the infinite scrolling is one mechanism one pattern that is employed to keep you on the system for hours and hours now imagine that instead of scrolling forever, you have pagination. So at the end of page one, you have to press page two, like in a Google search. Probably after a while, you, you stop to say page 100, 101. It gives you a sense that, okay, maybe I spent too much time here. I'm page 100, maybe, or page 10 or page 50. It's more visible. The amount of information, the amount of posts you have seen. Infinite scrolling, you always scroll and you always have new content to to look at and this goes on forever so while infinite scrolling has its own benefit as a pattern and it is a pattern it's a design pattern of course uh, for mobile especially in can be used in social media to keep you on the platform to keep you spend time on the platform and that will generate of course revenues for the company because it has more active users, the users see more advertisement, etc., etc., etc. So that is not a deceptive pattern. It could be a specific way, or is a specific way of deceptive pattern that are in these categories of attention capture deceptive pattern, damaging pattern in this way. So patterns that um, capture your attention and don't want your attention to, to go away. And infinite scrolling is one example. Uh, the pull to refresh is another example it's called the casino pull to refresh because when you pull to refresh you get new content like in a slot machine and never ending autoplay is another after a video you see another video you see another video you spend hours and hours in seeing videos on youtube uh, if you don't disable it so these are all patterns especially for social media and video services like youtube netflix etc uh, notifications etc so here if you if you are curious you can you can have a look at this uh, attention capture pattern and maybe have a look at this if you are doing the first lot and you're working on mental health or something and you are creating a mobile application because you want to avoid some of these in your prototype as well especially again if you are slot number one and you are working on health on a well-being mental health stress related perspective because this can can have an impact on on some aspects hmm? so have a look at this um, so here there is quite a lot of a lot of examples uh, with also link and references and with that we can stop for today uh, if you still need to to stay here for work a little bit you can you can go to lunch if you have any question you can ask next week on monday you will have a lecture on human interaction with Tommaso, not with me. And on Tuesday, uh, there will be Alberto instead talking about medium fidelity prototype. That will be the next step after the risk evaluation. 
see you, some of you tomorrow and for the other, have a nice rest of the week. <laughs>